Greetings to all those now joining this scope once again. This is the Overcomer, now live via Periscope. And tonight we will, be, we will conclude this series of the Beatitudes by studying on the eighth and final Beatitude on Matthew chapter 5, dealing on persecuted for the truth. Good evening, good evening, welcome. And this is what we'll be studying on this evening. And at this time you can invite all those that follow you on Periscope and also shares via Twitter and Facebook as you get right into the message concluding the series of the Beatitudes that are persecuted for the truth. Amen. This will conclude the series of the Beatitudes and we're going to get deep into the message led by the Spirit of God and that once we are done with this study, may we all examine ourselves to see if we are abiding in Christ, abiding in the faith, or we are the opposite of those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Amen. Let us examine ourselves. And again, welcome. Welcome once again. And at this time, let's all have a word of prayer. And then we'll begin in our study for this evening, concluding the series of the Beatitudes. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask once again for the outpouring of your spirit. And as we come to the end of the series of the Beatitudes, dealing on number eight, may we not only understand or the, the ones that are truly persecuted for your word and how is it that we are that most Christians here in the world today especially outside of the, of the new world are persecuted and are being killed and massacred and how is, and who is it really that the world is against and what we need to understand please O oh Lord may we not be fearful but that we will put our trust in thee knowing that all these things are but for a moment, and that at the very end, we shall receive our everlasting reward, and that Christ shall redeem us as his own, and shall claim us as his own. Please, Lord, be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So again, this is the final beatitude dealing on the persecuted for the truth. And let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse number 10, down to verse number 12. Dealing on the eighth and final beatitude, the persecuted for the truth. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 10 to 12, reads this. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now goes on to say, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Amen. Greetings, Sister Stephanie. Welcome. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So here we have the final beatitude dealing on the persecuted. So after we, after all the other beatitudes that we dealt on weeks ago and before and recently, this eighth beatitude is perhaps the most trying and the most very painful beatitude that we any of us can experience or even attain. Yes, there's... Blessed are the pure in heart, those that mourn, those that meet the, the hunger and thirst for righteousness, all these other things. But this beatitude right here, those that are persecuted for righteousness sake, is something which many of us find very difficult to attain. But we need not despair or give up. Once we get deep into this study, we'll see how that we can endure unto the end that we may be saved and how it is possible for us to rejoice even in the midst of our trials and our fiery persecution. Amen. But the first question is, who are the ones that are being persecuted to whom Christ, of whom Christ said, blessed? Turn me to the book of John chapter 16. John chapter 16 is where we go to next. John chapter 16. And we'll read from verse number 18 down to verse number 21. John chapter 15 verse from verse 18 to 21 reads this if the world hate you ye know that it hated me before it hated you now it reads on if he were of the world 
the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Let's stop here for a moment. So Christ is saying that because I have chosen you, or in other words, I have separated you from being a part of the world, the world despises you and even hates you from the very core of their own hearts. But they're not really hating you. They're really hating me, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and right now, our great high priest. So whenever anybody despises us or mocks us or calls us any names or even trolls us, they're not really despising us per se. They're really despising the one who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, they are actually fighting against God. Christ is the one who is being persecuted in the person of his people. Amen. Let's get dig, dig deep into this. Hold your finger in John chapter 15. Uh, if I said chapter 16, I meant chapter 15. Those are the verses, so I beg your pardon. But hold John chapter 15 with your Bible marker or your finger. Let's turn to the book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 17. Because we need to understand who, who is the chief agent that is motivating the entire world to persecute us. And there's only one, and that is Satan himself. Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 17. Most of us know it by heart. Amen. Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 17 says this. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, God's church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and not the testimony of Jesus Christ. So those that keep God's commandments, that keep his word, and it says on Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy, they are the ones whom Satan hates the most. They are the ones who are going to finish the work in these last days. And because he knows that if they are sanctified and even consecrated unto God in all aspects of their lives, and what they eat and drink and what they dress and whatsoever they do, doing all to reflect the character of Jesus Christ, he knows that Satan's work in deceiving souls will be limited and even being hindered because of the work of faithful souls who love God with all their hearts and who hate sin with a perfect hatred. And therefore, he's doing all that he can to destroy them or even possibly even more, with more in a more subtle way to lure them, to deceive them, to beguile these very ones into sin, into the world. And that way, his work may be accomplished, his own agenda his own goal of destroying souls may succeed with, with nothing stopping in its way this is who this is the very person who is motivating the entire world against us once we are not of the world even though we are in the world but we keep god's commandments and we abide in his word amen let's turn back to john chapter 15 because we need to understand, because so often we forget as to why we're going through these things. And we think that these things are just by accident. No, it's a spiritual warfare. And this spiritual warfare, the great controversy, will not cease until Jesus comes. When Christ comes, he will put an end to all these things. And the great controversy will be put to an end. And Christ will indeed triumph at the very end and Satan will eventually lose. But let's move on. John chapter 15. Let's continue in verse number 20 now. John 15 verse number 20 says, Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. He didn't say they may persecute or they might. He said they will. He's assuring them that in the future, they will, without a shadow of a doubt, be persecuted if they would follow the footsteps of their master, Jesus Christ. Move on. If they kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But notice now, verse 21, but all these things will they do unto you for my sake, 
because they know not him that sent me. So Christ is giving simple reasons why we will be persecuted. So number one, we are, we are sanctified, meaning that we are set apart from the world, from worldliness. That's number one. And number two, because we are abiding in Christ, the world hates us. They don't hate us. They don't hate me. They don't hate you. They hate Jesus. If you were living like Jesus Christ, the world would not be around you or in your society. They will not. Not even for, for just one time. But if they were, if if you were like them, then they would be in your society. They, they would, would like you. They will not do anything to, um, to destroy you or to hurt your influence. But if you're on God's side, oh no, they will do nothing to defend you or to stand by your side. They will utterly forsake you. And if, if you're doing all that you can to, to win them unto Christ, they'll push you away. They'll shove you, they'll curse at your face, and they'll cast out your name as evil, as Christ says, and they will cast you out completely and not even have even a thought of they being worked on to you or you being worked on to them unless you quote unquote apologize or that you compromise, give up your faith, give up the word of God. And be one with them once again and thus forsake the word of God and its principles forsaking Christ himself Christ clearly said that if any man be ashamed of me and of my words the Son of Man himself will also be ashamed of him and that when he comes he will say unto that person who have been unfaithful and who compromised depart from me you worker of iniquity it's very serious. That's why we cannot give up. I cannot give up. Especially the young people like myself, we cannot give up. Even though these trials are very hard and living a, a, a true Christian lifestyle is very difficult and not easy, it is possible only through the grace of Christ to live his life, to walk by faith, and to keep the mind and the eyes focused on heaven and not on circumstances nor on the things of this world because if we're looking onto the world in the perplexities of trials and its hardness we will eventually give up because we're not focusing on Jesus but when we look upon Christ the author and finisher of our faith mm -hmm. then and only then we can endure amen that's the only way that we can make it is when our eyes are fixed upon Christ Amen. Psalm 16 says that I have set the Lord always before my face. He is at my right hand that I shall not be moved. Amen. So, verse number 21, but all these things will they do unto you for my sake. Again, for righteousness sake. We read in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 10. So in other words, for the sake of Christ, our righteousness, we will be persecuted because we are eating day by day of the spiritual manna, we will be loathed at as weak and as inferior. Let's compare this now to another item within the Ark of the Covenant of the Most Holy Place, the final item within the Ark, and that is a golden pot full of manna. Because once we have this experience of a body in Christ, who is our anti-typical manna, we will be loathed at and be despised. But if we're otherwise, we will be loved as the world's own. Let's dig deep into this. Turn me to the book of Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16 is where we'll go to as we study on the manna. Because the manna pointed to Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 16. And let's read... A few verses there, Exodus chapter 16, in verse number 14 and verse number 15. Exodus chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, reads this. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, a, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist 
The word wish means no. They knew not what it was. Keep that phrase in mind. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. So they looked upon that bread and they called it manna. Why did they call it manna? Because they had no idea what that bread was. In other words, the word manna means unknown. Again, the word manna for the original Hebrew means unknown or what is it? They had no idea what it was and therefore they called it manna, unknown. When you put it together, unknown bread. And who is that bread? The bread is Jesus Christ. Close Exodus chapter 16. Let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is our next text. John chapter 6. And let's start reading in verse number 48. John chapter 6 and verse number 48 reads, I am that bread of life. This is Jesus speaking. You have fallen to eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread, pointing to him to himself, which came down from heaven. I'm sorry, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. So he made a comparison between himself and the manna which the ancient Israelites had eaten in the wilderness. Now the manna which God given to them was a literal bread and only sustained them physically, but not for eternity. It only lasted them for a while to sustain their, their physical hunger. And after that, after years had passed, they died. But Christ, the spiritual anti-typical manna, is the only bread that will last forever. That once we eat of this bread, eat of his flesh, drink of his blood, communing with him in his word, every morning, evening, at noon, we, he will dwell in us and we in him. And this is all about abiding Christ, walking in him. Daily communion. And once we have this continual permanent experience, then we will be considered as, as, as an awkward um, folk, as weird, as strange, as someone who is not really um, popular, as some people say. Someone who is not really um, someone who you, you do not want to hang out with. They're not. They're not really some someone whom you're to to um to be friend with. There there are nobody. I'm sure you heard that phrase before. There are nobody. Don't hang out with them. They're not like us. They they need. I, I, hey, if if they were to do, if they were to be like us, if they were to do the same things that we do, hey, we can be like them. We can hang out with them, be in their society, but. These Christians, these folks that consider themselves as God's people, a small group of um, those that keep God's commandments and the faith of Jesus, don't hang out with them. I mean, they're not like us. And this is exactly what God has called us for. A peculiar people, a holy nation, and a royal priesthood reflecting the character, the glory of God. He has not called us to be like the world but to be unlike the world. But many of us, we have compromised. We've compromised our faith. We compromise our profession. But guess what? We still profess to be Christians. We go to church every single Sabbath. And we may say, we may sing songs during the song service. And we may um, hear the word of God being preached at the pulpit during the sermon. And we may have a great fellowship time. But what do we talk about in our conversations during fellowship? What do we talk about even at the prayer meeting, especially after the prayer meeting, are our thoughts meditating upon Christ or our thoughts upon the world, upon secular business, upon our jobs, upon our schools, upon all these other temporal things that will pass away? Are our thoughts upon Christ or our thoughts upon the world? If we're if they're of, if they're on the, of the world, we're not peculiar people. We are like the world. And does it matter how many times that we may say that we are Christian or that we're Seventh-day Adventists or we are this and that, doesn't matter. If you are like the world through through your manners, through your words, 
to your deployment to your conversation, you are clearly identified with the world. Now you may you may dress up in your suit, your tie, or your bow tie. You look nice on Sabbath, but what do you do after you come home after church? You're you're out there just watching um, sports on television. You are playing video games, and you are playing Uno. You're playing Pac-Man. You're just watching all those Hollywood movies that have nothing to do with God, nor spirituality, nor of righteousness. You are sitting at, at your table, at your dinner, for breakfast, lunch, or even dinner, eating certain things that are unclean. You're eating pork, flesh meats, you're eating shrimp, and you are playing competitive games with your friends or your neighbors, playing chess, checkers, and you joke in your jest 24 seven, and you may say that, oh yeah, I go to church every Sabbath, or, uh, or those of you who are first-day Adventists, that you go to church every Sunday or whatever, whatever de denomination, it also applies to you. It applies to you too. Doesn't matter what you do. If you are like the world in any of these things I just listed, you are not a true Christian. You are a friend of the world, the enemy of God. And don't take my words for it. This is exactly what the Bible says. Turn me to the book of James chapter four, and verse number four. James chapter four and verse number four. Turn me there. James chapter 4 and verse number 4. The Bible clearly warns us that if we are at the front of the world, we are the enemy of God. James chapter 4 verse number 4 says, He adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity, hatred, variance with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. In other words, if you are a friend of the world, you're not only an enemy, but also the enemy. You are like the devil. You are like Satan in your heart. You are like, you can, you can be even like Lucifer, dressed in beauty and glory at church, but at, but at home, you are living like the devil himself. And you talk like the devil and you think like the devil saying all these things for your own selfishness and not glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. How are, how are you then a Christian? How are you really Christian? Or are you really a true follower of Christ through your self-denial, through your self-sacrifice, doing the will of the Lord and be sanctified, be made holy in your heart, in your mind, in all parts of your body. The mind and the heart must be sanctified. If not sanctified, hey, devils can reign supreme despite of you being outwardly clean like a white sepulcher, like, the, like Christ said about the Pharisees and the scribes. You're like a white sepulcher, but in your heart is full of dead men's bones and all manner of, of um, hypocrisy and uncleanness. So there's no difference, no difference between the world and us if we're living like the world. No difference, no distinction, no line of distinction between those that serve God and those that serve him not if we are mingling with the world. Amen? Now let's turn back to Matthew chapter 5. Because those are the only individuals whom the world will not persecute. They will not persecute them because, because, they, because they will say, wait a minute, these individuals, why would I hate them? I, I'm friends with the, hey, listen, I'm friends with them on, on, um, on Facebook. I follow them on Twitter and I follow them on Periscope. I'm, I follow them on Instagram. And yes, yeah, 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 even, even though that person does post things about Bible and spirit prophecy and about health, health reform, but I'm not worried about him. He's like me. I mean, we eat shrimp together um, at, at my house, and I visit his home, and we um, we go out and hang out at a concert, at a nightclub, and we drink together, we smoke weed, smoke tobacco, and we hang out with our girlfriends. Doesn't matter. I like him. He's my buddy. Yeah, yeah, it, does, it doesn't matter because, yeah, he does post Bible stuff on social media, but right here, he's my best buddy. Again. The world is not blind or stupid to the fact 
that if we're not living to the profession of our faith, the world would care less about us, care less. And Satan himself will be so happy and he can care less about that as well. But, but if we are the opposite of those that, that are hearers of the word, but not doers, but link to all the light that we ha that God has given to us, Satan will not be idle as he has never have been. And he do all they can to cause that soul who is, the, who is keeping God's commandments in the faith of Jesus to swerve from the path of duty back onto the world. But if it continues in the faith, as did Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, and Joseph and Moses and all the others, Satan's fury, his ire will be kindled to the highest extent, and he'll do all that he can to destroy that soul. Why? Because these are the very instruments of righteousness to do the work of the Lord and to win souls unto Christ and to the kingdom of heaven. So let let it let us allow these things to sink down in our minds and our ears, as especially as we are nearing towards a close of probation and the final hours of this earth's history. Matthew chapter five once again. Actually, actually no, don't don't go there yet. Let's go to chapter 16 of the, of the book of John. Amen. Let's now make the next um, chapter. Go to the next chapter in chapter 16 of the book of John. Let's read from verse 1 down to verse number 3. Christ goes into depth and asking the question, who will be the ones that will persecute us? And this answer to the question will be something which many of us will find very difficult to think about because those persecutors are not wordlings. Those persecutors are not wordlings. Let's prove that. John chapter 16, 16 verse 1 to 3 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues, the churches. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will he do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So those persecutors come from the church. We will be persecuted by those who profess to be Christians, but those very quote unquote Christians will persecute real Christians. Wait a minute, you mean to tell me that those very ones are the, or that they profess to be a part of God's professed people? Wait a minute. Those same ones who fellowship with us every single Sabbath and every single prayer meeting and, and every Wednesday will be the ones that shall cast us out, that may blot out our names from the church books, that may unfriend us on Facebook, that may unfollow us on Twitter, that may not talk to us via the phone or via text message, that they will be the ones that shall call us as offshoots, as fundamentalists, as extremists, as alarmists, as fanatics. That is something that which will cause us even the even greater perplexity of mind. Yes, yes, the trials, they will cause us some hurt, some hurt and pain in the heart, but what will hurt us the most and so those very ones are the ones who are part of our household. What did Christ say? He said they that a man's enemies are those of his own household. So let me give this give, give this example to you. So let's let's say for example, a person has families and he has a church family. He preaches truth and he walks in the word of God. And what does he, he what what does he do? He preaches truth, present truth, and he gets mocked by a wordling and, and 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 that wordling mocks him persecutes him and says all kinds of evil against him and the person says oh um okay you can call me whatever you want but i'm gonna stand faithful in jesus you, you i don't i don't really care what you say about me i'm gonna continue forward so he passes along and he doesn't worry about he doesn't worry about the wordling but he gets mocked by by um by someone who is a member of his own church. And that may hurt him a little bit, but not as much. 
and and he says still okay you're you're mocking me but I'm, I'm still not gonna get hurt I'm still going to remain faithful but notice now what if his own persecutor is his own wife or or his um or his mother oh that's going to cause him the more pain that's going to be a stabbing on the back a stabbing on the chest a slice off of the head because that persecutor is is his own wife or mother or his own relative someone who was close to him you see that's right brother Reuben ouch that's going to cause the deeper pain you're going to feel so hurt so so wounded wounded in the battle because that person who hurt who was so close to you would do all they can to 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 punch you in the face, spiritually speaking, punch you in the face, kick you, spit at your face, and says to you that I'm not going to hang out with you anymore, or God forbid, I can. Some of you cannot even imagine. I want, I want to divorce you. I don't want to be your wife anymore. I don't want to be your husband anymore. I'm going to divorce you. You'll be. Oh, you're you're going to feel the deepest, the deepest hell. That will be the deepest hell for you. That you can ever experience in your own home your own wife persecuting you because of the truth that you have from god's word and which you are wholeheartedly obeying that's going to hurt you that is going that is something that is going to try the most that's not so much someone who is not who is not acquainted with you but someone who is close to you and who professes to love you and who used to do all these things to treat you kindness and respect but ultimately will turn his his or her back against you and now doing all that he can to to forsake you and to despise you this is why we need to have Jesus Christ supreme in our hearts and our minds and our love for him must, must be so powerful so great that it cannot be moved because if we have not the love of Christ abiding in our hearts, we will give up. We will say, you know what? I give up. I give up my faith. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to stop preaching preaching truth from the word of God. And I'm going to um, compromise my faith because I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. This is what some of us will say if we are not faithful and if we're not abiding in Christ. This is what will happen. But once again, we do not need to be discouraged. And, and listen, I know, I personally know a certain, only a few individuals who love me so much and who are close to me, but because I've been changed by the grace and the power of God, those same individuals who love me so much and I love them back are not friends with me anymore. And we don't talk to each other anymore. I know it. I know it very well. And some of you can tell that, can say that of yourself as well. But once again, we need to stop putting self high in consideration and, and simply look at Christ. Look back at what Christ had gone through. Look at Christ. Christ himself went through persecution. He went through severe trial. He was rejected by his own people, yet not so much by the Samaritans, even though he did, so, he did to, he has to some extent experienced rejection um, from a few heathens or from few Gentiles, but the majority of his rejection came most from his own people, even his own family, his own family members, and even his own disciples did not understand him, and even his own brothers despised him, and they did not believe that Christ was the Messiah, the, the Messiah, the Son of God, and they were doing all all that that they can to discourage Christ in his ministry and even his own disciples like Peter himself when he was speaking the words of Satan himself saying be it far from me Lord this shall not be unto thee when Christ spoke about his coming crucifixion and what did Christ say get thee behind me Satan for thou art an offense unto me for thou savest not the things that be of God but the things that be of men so even his own disciples didn't understand him and Christ felt that he was so lonely in this world even John the Beloved, John the Apostle, did not understand Christ, even though he was so close to him. It does not matter who is close to us. We will come to a point in which we will stand alone, and we have to stand for our faith 
and what we have experienced with the word of God. And if we're not rooted, grounded, and settling the truth, we will compromise and we'll give up. Because the word of God has not settled into our life experience. So the choice that all of us, even for myself as well, will have to make is why stand on Christ or why stand on the sandy foundation, which is not a foundation, but sinking sand that will cause me to be lost and to lose the battle and to be lost in perdition and in sin and ultimately lose the goal of the high price of my calling from Jesus Christ. We need to be encouraged and all of us need to be strengthened. Amen? So this is what we, I want us to keep in mind. So once again, let's draw this so close. And I want all of us to be encouraged by God's Spirit. Amen? Matthew chapter 5, once again, in verse number 11, Christ was coming a little more personal because all the other verses that he said before, he said, blessed are they, blessed are such and such, blessed are they, they, they. But this time, verse number 11, Christ says, blessed are ye, blessed are you. So in other words, he's coming a little bit more personal now, more individual, because a time will come in which all of us will have to stand alone. I have to stand alone. I cannot stand with, with my mom. And none of us, those of you who are married, who have husbands or wives, you have to stand alone. For those of you who have kids, grandkids, you have to stand alone. And you will be forsaken. And those, and those kids, sons and daughters who are faithful and who live into the profession of faith, to the highest extent according to God's word, they will be taken from you, either by death or by exile or by whatever means all of us will have to be alone and we'll, we will experience the greatest trials which any of us can ever experience amen but christ is always with each of us though we are alone in this world christ is always with us and he will always encourage us to be faithful he is with me and he is with you we none of us are ever alone never alone why because of christ and the father and the holy angels they, they that take um that take charge over us to keep us in all our ways and that is what is to encourage us even though we do not see this we don't see the angels with a visible eye the invisible veil is over us we can see by faith angels enshrouding over us smiling with their faces on us because we are faithful and we do, and we are following the Lamb, whithersoever He goeth, even in this straight and narrow path. Amen. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So, because you are a body in Christ abiding in the unknown bread, the manna in your heart, you will be persecuted. And and why is it so? Because all those that, that are unlike you, they see your character and they see your deportment, your conversation that is unlike them, and that your godliness, your righteousness, which is from Christ, is a stern rebuke unto them. A stern rebuke. The way that you eat, the way that, that you dress, the way that you speak, and the way that you the way that you do things in your workplace at your school at your job or wherever you go or even at, at your church because not every church member is a holy person because even with the members there are wolves in sheep's clothing every if you are living like Christ people will unlike you and they will separate you they they may not talk to you during fellowship they may not sit with you during at the pew when the sermon is being preached. They may not sit with you. They may separate themselves from you like this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And then in their mind, they're saying, I'm not talking to this person. Not talking to this holier-than-thou person. 
Oh my gosh. This is what they're, they're going to do. And, and of course, what they're going to do is, is just so irrational. This is a full result of you abiding in Christ. And even the pastor himself, the pastor may indirectly speak about you at the pulpit while preaching, and you may not even know it. You're listening and you're like, okay, amen, amen, amen. But in the in the mind of the preacher, he's speaking about you, and with hatred in his heart, he sees that you are living the same way as, as did Christ, and the pastor himself, who ought to live what he's preaching, but is not, Lord have mercy. He does all that he can to to, so, to throw rocks at your face indirectly. It's like he tries all that he can to blind your eyes to, or to blindfold you and then throws rock at your face, stoning you. And you'd be like, who threw the stones at me? And the pastor's like, oh, I did nothing. Oh, no. And it's all your imagination. I just, I was just, you know, saying these things in general. You see? Even persecution can be at the church. And that is the most, one of the most, one of the greatest trials that we can ever experience. Amen? And once again, all these things will come upon us because we're living like Jesus Christ and we are abiding in Him. And that is one of the things which many people cannot even see. They, they, just, they just can't see Christ. They don't know Christ. They themselves, the persecutors, do not have a personal relationship with Christ. And because of that, when they see you, they'll, they'll be like, wait a minute, why are you rebuking me? You, you, how dare you tell me that I am to live right, that I am to live like Christ, or that I cannot dress like this, or I cannot um, dress in the way that I want to dress, or I cannot eat in the way that I want to eat? Oh, how, how do you, 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 you tell me that I cannot go to McDonald's or go to Burger King or I can go to IHOP or I cannot um, visit my, um, my, uh, my boyfriend, that I cannot um, do all these things on Facebook and, and, and post nude pictures of myself and with my boyfriend and just, and just say all kinds of um, Bible texts from the Song of Solomon and saying all kinds of um, blah, blah, blah. How do you tell me that? Wait a minute. They'll, 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 they'll do all they can to, to justify themselves. And they'll do all they can to defend themselves. And they'll, and they'll accuse you as being holier than thou. Even though, even though they themselves are holier than thou. You see? This, this, is, this is how brainwashed many of us have become. And because... And because the majority of God's people are such, the work is not being finished, and mo and we are all still here in 2017. And persecution against God's oppressed people is is still happening. It's occurred, but not but not to us yet, but to all the other ones, even outside of the United States, outside of North America, outside of the, the New World, until all the other parts of the world. To all those that are living up to the light that they have, even though they are not seventy Adventists, they are keeping God's commandments and they're being butchered, they're being martyred, beheaded, being wiped out, exterminated. But us here that have all the light of truth are sitting here doing nothing and like idle blind men and women who know not where we're going because we are in darkness. In crisis, if we're walking in darkness, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. So now as we have gone through all these things, we need to make a full decision as to, who, as to whom we want to be a part of. Do we want to be of the popular easy, easy side with the, majority, with the majority of the world? Or will we be a part of those who keep God's commandments at the faith of Jesus, though they are the minority, the small group, the despised sect, the despised of the world, the persecuted for the truth. And by being with them, we are actually being with Jesus because Jesus is in them. But if you, but if you decide to be a part of the majority, 
being being um, urged by quote unquote peer pressure, you will um, you decide to to um, to cave in to their suggestions and to their um, their temptations, their insinuations, and to all these things that they, they present to you to false promises. You will you give in. Guess what? You have fallen from your faith. You have forsaken Christ, and you have spat upon, spat upon Christ. You have become a Judas Iscariot. Become a Judas Iscariot, and all these other, um, all these other individuals who have forsaken Christ, having loved the things of the world. And what is the full result of these things? Where is the reward? Eternal death. And what should be the motto of every Christian? Simply this: death before dishonor and that is the same model which the persecuted for the truth have death before dishonor i would rather be put to death i would rather suffer separation from friends from family even be deprived of my possessions than to sin against god than to dishonor against the holy one of israel and that motto even though many of us say it casually we're not living that motto, death before dishonor. This is this is exactly what we must possess. We must live this motto in everyday life and wherever we go. And that way God can truly see us abiding in Christ, abiding in the unknown bread, the manna, that, that we can be indeed the light of the world, the golden candlestick, and the salt of the earth. But the salt has lost its savor, or it shall be salted, if you go for nothing and be cast out and trodden under the foot of men, and thus be left for nothing. But let us be faithful and continue in this path of self denial in that way, once we have Christ always before us in our hearts, that He will be with us even all the way to the end. Despite by various sayings that people say about us, either flattery or censure. Especially censure should not motivate us or move us to swerve from our duty to God and to man. Let's close off this. What should be our attitude when we're persecuted? Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Our attitude is to rejoice and to be exceeding glad. That is very unnatural when we go to trials because usually through trials, we get discouraged, we get offended, we get annoyed, we get upset, we get angry, and we get frustrated when we go to trials. But Christ says that we are to endure these things cheerfully. We are to endure all these trials with a cheerful, joyful spirit. Why? Because Christ had gone through these things and he himself had triumphed at the very end and has overcome the world. And that, and so likewise, we, we, once we endure, we too shall have the same reward as did Christ. Let's close off this text. John chapter 16 and verse number 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. And this is one of my favorite and blessed scripture songs to those that know it. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Christ has overcome the world, endured tribulation, and therefore that great example that he set for us should be followed by all of us who profess to look for things that are eternal and things that shall not pass away, yea, for the new Jerusalem and for the earth made new. Once we have this in view, we can have the strength in thee. Once we ask of the wisdom and the endurance and the patience that Christ possessed, that God would give unto us, and that we can indeed, excuse me, live these things, walk in the ways of God, enduring fire, trials, and temptation, 
and that we can indeed make it at the very end of our journey, saved at last, overcome the world, that when Christ comes, he shall say of us, come, ye blessed my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Well done, thou good and faithful servants. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. This is a precious promise that we can all claim and we can all possess even now. Amen. If you decide, if you decide today to give your life unto Christ and surrender all unto him, put yes or amen on the screen as we conclude the series of the Beatitudes and that our decisions will be sealed both now and forever. Walking in Christ. Amen. 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 Let us continue in this path of obedience as well as communion with Christ in his word, eating of that manna that we may not only be filled ourselves, but that we can share this with others, share the light that we have, that they too may be delivered from darkness, from ignorance unto light. Amen. And at this time, let's all pray to close and I will end the scope. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed study that we went through. And we ask to allow these words to sink down in our minds and our, in our ears. And that we meditate upon them. And though we've heard these things this night, we must never forget what Christ had gone through and what all the other prophets and apostles of all have gone through. That once we study their lives, even the life of Christ and beholding him, that we too can have this same experience and the same victory that he had and that his, the apostles had, that Paul had, that Joseph had, that Daniel had, and all the others had. If we would just simply put our eyes on Christ and not on self, nor on the things of the world. For all these things will pass away, but your word shall not pass away. Please, Lord, we actually forgive us of our sins, our unbelief, and our unfaithfulness, and, and us being friend with the world, and you cleanse us all from all unrighteousness, and help us that we will be enemies of the world, but friends of thee, and of thee, doing thy will, and continuing in thy path of righteousness, and abiding Christ, following him, following the Lamb, with us wherever he goeth. We thank you for hearing this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And God bless you too. I pray you all were blessed. And again, thank you for tuning to all the series of the Beatitudes. And I pray that if it's if, if those of you who, who came here to the scope for the first time, you can watch all the other scopes I've done dealing on the Beatitudes from one to eight, even now, and that you can watch these things, study these things, and study even the word for yourself to know that if these things are so, and that will make a thorough preparation even right now to to be rooted, grounded, settled in the truth, and that we will get ready, get ready, get ready. So God bless, and I wish you all a good night rest. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Amen.